This is a part one of a lecture on solar and net radiation. And, you know, the Earth receives a tremendous amount of energy from the sun at all times. And that's the energy that really drives a lot of our meteorological processes, drives evaporation, drives photosynthesis, so many things that are key to how agricultural crops and ecosystems and watersheds, how they all function. So it's really important that we get grasp uh, how to uh, measure and model and use solar and uh, radiation data. So again, radiation is really important for two key reasons. One is energy. So radiation, solar radiation is providing the energy that we need to evaporate water, heat the soil. Um, it creates boundary layer stability. Uh, you know, even wind, wind is created by differential heating of the earth by solar energy. So even wind energy is solar energy. When we talk about uh, radiation in terms of energy, we're usually using units of watts per meter squared. A watt is a joule per second. So joules of energy received on the surface per second per meter squared of land area. And net radiation is a, is a subtopic under that and we'll talk a lot about that because uh, uh, we don't want to just know the amount of energy that's hitting the earth we want to know the net amount that's available because not all energy that's received is absorbed and uh, we need to account for that. The other reason radiation is important is because of plant processes primarily photosynthesis of course. So one area of micrometeorology that's that's very well developed is how radiation penetrates and moves through the plant canopy and how that's affected by plant architecture, leaf area, things like that. So um, that's a really important part of radiation as well. Uh, also remember that the phytochrome systems and uh, some of the other uh, photoresponsive aspects of plant growth are controlled by radiation. So you know when your plants are um, below other plants in the in the in the crop canopy or in a forest or wherever it changes the spectra of light that they received and it um, uh, impacts how they grow so radiation affects the growth of plants uh, directly uh, as well as through the process of photosynthesis when we talk about photosynthesis we're really talking about photosynthetically active radiation so we'll talk about that some more later and that usually is described in units of micromoles of photons per meter squared per second. So again radiation appears in a lot of our important equations in hydrology so the ASCE standardized reference evapotranspiration formula here's the net radiation term this is a huge term uh, has a really large impact on the results probably more than any other parameter in this equation so it's important that we get that right uh, and we'll spend quite a bit of time learning how to estimate net radiation. Canopy photosynthesis obviously that's huge um, and we know that photosynthesis for different kinds of plants reacts differently to different levels and quantities of, of photosynthetically active radiation. Here we see a wheat plant as the uh, absorbed PAR goes up that's photosynthetically active radiation we see a fairly linear response whereas in more broad leafed forest plants we see often kind of a flattened response this is the difference between um, grasses versus um, more deciduous or broad leaf plants so this is an evolutionary trait so really a huge area of uh, interest and there's been lots and lots of research done on this topic Crop yield modeling is often done with radiation because we know that plants, there's a relationship between the amount of radiation that they absorb and the uh, amount of carbon that they fix from the air. And of course that affects the yield and growth. So a lot of crop models work by modeling the amount of radiation that the crop absorbs and then converting that into carbon and then allocating that to different parts of the plant to simulate growth. When you want to talk about radiation, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is really important to understand because, you know, us as humans, we're very um, uh, used to thinking about radiation in the visible spectrum. But that's a very small part of the total wavelength spectrum that we're interested in. You know, of course, 
we're used to things like gamma rays or x-rays if we go into the hospital for an x-ray um, but once we start getting into the terrestrial system right and when we're outdoors we're interested in ultraviolet the visible infrared and near infrared so right there in the center of this graph is a whole bunch of wavelengths that we're interested in that are affecting either things like evapotranspiration or plant growth. Dr. Campbell and Dr. Norman in your textbook have a really nice um, depiction of this. So they show here in this top section that there's really two kinds of radiation that we're most interested in. Radiation from the sun, solar radiation, which includes our ultraviolet, visible, and our near-infrared. And then we're also interested in terrestrial radiation. Some people call this thermal, right? So, you know, when you open up a warm oven and you feel that blast of heat, that blast of radiation, it's not visible, but you certainly feel it. That's long wave radiation uh, that's being emitted from surfaces inside the oven and moving out and, and interacting with and hitting you, and you can feel that energy. So we really, on the, when we're on the surface of the Earth, there's, there's these two forms of energy, of radiant energy that we have to consider, solar and terrestrial, or short wave and long wave, okay? We have to consider them both. And then he breaks them up into different areas here. You can see the different colors that we're familiar with. Um, the photosynthetically active radiation is between 400 and 700 nanometers or 0.4 and 0.7 microns. Um, notice that the phytochrome system here, this is the one that affects how plants elongate and grow, the cell elongation. It's right here in the 660 to 730. And then this near infrared uh, area is also really important when it comes to plant growth. So all this is um, really key. The UV section um, doesn't affect plant growth so much directly or water use directly but it affects photomutagenic behavior so plants um, can yeah, UV radiation just like UV radiation can cause skin cancer in humans UV radiation can cause um, genetic mutations in plants as well so also an important thing to sort of consider although not as relevant when we think about hydrology or crop growth models Here's another plot of showing um, the uh, two different wavelengths that we're interested in uh, in the radiant spectrum. So here's the short wave spectrum. Okay, so the here surface of the sun at 6,000 degrees Kelvin. This is the spectrum that it emits according to Planck's law, and we see the peak here right around in the right around 0.4 microns, and then. On the other hand, here's the terrestrial radiation, the temperature of the Earth, 288K, right, or, um, you know, 25 degrees Celsius, our kind of typical room temperature, outdoor temperatures, with a peak around 10 microns, right. So this one we see, we can see a lot with our eyes, this one we can't, but both are really important, and you can see there's a lot of energy in each one. Oh, just backing up a little bit this one you know sometimes you'll hear me use the term short wave and long wave okay this is what I'm talking about short wave radiation long wave radiation or solar radiation versus terrestrial radiation so again solar radiation at the ground uh, you know if you take measurements above the Earth's atmosphere that's what this curve is right here this extraterrestrial curve we see uh, that there's a lot of radiation up there that never makes it down to the ground. That's because a lot of that radiation is filtered by the atmosphere, especially in the UV, right? But lots of other wavelengths are attenuated, okay? And especially out here in the near infrared uh, or in the longer spectrum. So we have to con take that into consideration uh, that the atmosphere is filtering radiation and shifting the spectrum and certainly we notice that real obviously when it's cloudy versus sunny right completely different um, experience on the ground but we also notice that when there's lots of dust in the air uh, aerosols pollution other things like that can affect this filtering effect so can be very important it's interesting to look at where most of the energy is. I know a lot of you are really interested in hydrology and evaporation. 
So if we look at this spectrum of solar energy, this is the sh what we would call the short wave spectrum. The short wave spectrum, if we look at where all the energy is, we see most of it's down here in the 400 to 700 and in the near infrared, right? So this one we can see with our eyes, but this one we really can't. So um, you can see that there's um, really lots of energy in the visible near infrared and, and even all the way up to 1500 uh, nanometers. So lots of energy between 400 and 1500, right? So if I ask you on a quiz, at what wavelengths contain most of the solar energy that strikes the Earth's surface, you look at this plot and uh, look at these two lines in particular seem to account for uh, you know almost 80 percent of all the energy. So again besides just the uh, energy part we're interested in what part is the photosynthetically active. Again this is in that 400 to 700 range. Uh, Dr. Keith McCree I had a chance to work with him when I was getting my PhD um, which was really great. He did some of the early work on figuring out um, what wavelengths um, account for photosynthesis and which ones are most important. Really crucial work. Now this is just something that everybody knows. Uh, 4 to 700 nanometers or 0.4 to 0.7 microns is the part of the spectrum that affects the phytochrome or expect, affects the um, chloroplasts in the leaf. Right where we get that excitation and we begin the carbon fixation process. So how do we measure all these things? Um, global radiation is normally measured with an instrument called a pyranometer, right? And if we had the perfect pyranometer, right, it would measure all the energy between across this huge spectrum. So if we go back a little bit, you know, it would get all of this energy, it would measure all of these um, perfectly and give us the, the ideal measurement. Unfortunately they don't always do that based on the type of principles that they're used. This is a uh, Epley pyranometer that does measure the full spectrum. It's about a five or six thousand dollar instrument, right? So um, these are not normally on a weather station, right? What we normally see is something like this. Here's a weather station and here you see the pyranometer. It's still a small plastic uh, cylinder mounted level here on the top of the uh, uh, weather station. And it's these kind of instruments. These made by Apogee and Lycor and I put a whole bunch of links down here for you to go look these up. Really small instruments here. They have a, usually have a photodiode inside and a little diffusing disc on top and these can be used to um, uh, measure uh, the uh, global irradiance we call it right which is the the short wave spectrum measured by the pyranometer and uh, remember these are only measuring the short wave spectrum not the long wave so again backing up pyranometers are measuring this piece right not this piece they're measuring this radiation from the sun So these instruments are not way cheaper. Uh, you can buy these for under $200, a lot of the time under um, $150. And, and they're pretty accurate and that's what you see on most weather stations like the ones used in Colorado, uh, for example, on the Coagmet Agricultural Weather Station system. This is what you find. And here, remember, we in any um, ag weather na network across the nation or across the world, you can usually look up what instruments are, have been deployed on each one. And we see right here, solar radiation is measured by LICOR LI200X pyranometer. Okay, shows what heights it's measured and um, a few other pieces of information. So always remember you can look that up. So if we look at the COAGMAT data, just for an example, uh, here from Colorado, we see that in the daily data format that might be coming from the weather network, we see solar radiation in megajoules per meter squared per day, right? That's uh, coming down. And if we looked at it on an hourly basis, it's kilojoules per meter squared per minute. Now, often uh, this is kind of an unusual unit. Um, a true SI unit would be joules 
uh, per meter squared per second or watts per meter squared. So often we'll convert that from um, per minute to per second and, and convert it to joules. So we can either get the daily radiation, total amount of radiation received over 24 hours, or we can get it every hour, how much was received every hour. And on the newer stations, you can get it every five minutes. Again, this unit. So here's what our data looks like from Greeley, Colorado, for example. Here's some hourly data. Here you see a couple of clear days, cloudy day, right? And here's the daily solar radiation that pairs with these. So you can see that you're getting about 30 megajoules per day on a really clear. Uh, these are the longest days of the year here. I picked those in June, late June. And uh, so we're getting lots and lots of energy. Here's the day we had a little bit of clouds that had a huge impact, right? So makes you thinking ahead, like how this is going to affect something like evapotranspiration, right? Now when you in the winter, of course, you pick the shortest days of the year, get a completely different um, look, much, much less energy, and uh, uh, much, much less daily energy. One of the things that's important, uh, will, can be important depending on the type of problem that you're working, is understanding the position of the sun in the sky and how and and being able to describe that at any location on any date at any hour of the day so the three things that we often use to describe the position of the sun in the sky is the azimuth angle that's the degrees from south right so if you stand outside and face south right and you look at the angle between your direction of view and the current position of the sun uh, thinking thinking like a compass um, that's the azimuth angle and then the uh, solar elevation angle is if you faced toward the sun and uh, measured the angle between the horizon and the position of the sun that's the solar elevation angle uh, the angle between the sun and vertical is the zenith okay so the two most common angles used to describe the position of the sun are the azimuth angle and zenith angle Sometimes you see the solar elevation angle. Remember, the zenith angle and the solar elevation angle are really giving you the same piece of information. One's just the other minus 90 degrees, right? So, um, or that angle, my, uh, 90 minus that angle. So, you know, they're kind of the same. So you really need two pieces of information, right, to describe the position of the, of the uh, sun in the sky. And we'll learn the equations to do that. Um, so, you know, at some point I'll give you your latitude, your longitude, the date, and the time of day and ask you to uh, calculate the azimuth angle and the zenith angle, right? There's also all kinds of online calculators that'll do that for you, uh, so uh, lots of ways to do that. Now, the reason the angle, the position of the sun in the sky is important in micrometeorology is because it, you know, it has it has an impact on how much radiation is absorbed by the surface, right? Especially a surface that's not flat, right? So we're going to talk about that here in a minute, um, but we got to cover another topic first, and that's the difference between diffuse and direct beam radiation. So the diffuse, um, when you, when you go outside and you stand outside and you're feeling that solar radiation from the sun uh, on your skin for example, or, or, or noticing how it's, it's shining off the top of your car or whatever, a portion of that radiation is coming directly from the direction of the sun. In other words, those photons traveled from the sun. They basically pass through the atmosphere unimpeded. They didn't react with any dust or clouds and they hit the surface, right? That's direct beam. Another portion of radiation that's hitting the surface is radiation that came from the sun but interacted with the atmosphere bounced off dust particles, bounced off water molecules, aerosols, other things that the, ladder, the light was scattered and then it's scattered across the whole semi-hemisphere of the atmosphere and then comes down from all directions. So it's coming down from all directions at all the time and you know that's basically when you look at something in the shade, right, something that's shaded, that's only receiving, you can still see it, right, but that's just because you're now um, uh, looking at only the diffuse component that struck that surface where when you're looking at something that's in full sun 
it's getting both diffuse and direct beam. So that's what's being depicted in these graphs. Um, here's the zenith angle, okay? So this is noon, think of this as like noon, and this is really late in the day or really early in the morning. So if this is noon, um, at noon, at high noon, uh, here's the total amount of shortwave radi uh, radiation that you're receiving. Most of it is from beam, it's direct beam, and a little bit diffuse, okay? This is on a nice, pretty sunny day with a clear sky, right? This is what's been, this is a clear sky, this is a cloudy sky on the right. So total amount of radiation, most of it's beam and just a little bit of diffuse. As you get closer to sunset, you get more diffuse. Here's a cloudy day on the right, and now we see that even at solar noon on a cloudy day, you know, um, about three-fourths or, or, or two-thirds of it is beam and about a third of it's diffuse. So diffuse is playing a lot bigger role, right? And when you get toward evening, diffuse becomes the very dominant form. So you have to know the difference between this diffuse and direct beam if you want to do a lot of different calculations, especially uh, crop canopy radiation modeling, estimating radiation on sloping ground, uh, sloping soil surfaces, ridge till, all kinds of things like that. So it's a, this is an important concept, realizing that the short wave radiation, you know, measured by your pyranometer on the weather station, is a combination of both direct beam and diffuse. And you know, your pyranometer by itself can't tell you that; it's just giving you the total, right? So there is a way to measure the diffuse component using what's called a shadow band or an occulting ring, and here they used to be all manual but here's a modern one now that you can see basically here's kind of the Lycor pyranometer and then there's this little motor that controls this shadow band and keeps this little sensor in the shade all day long so as the sun tracks across the sky this band moves and always keeps that little white disc there in the shade so this guy's only it's blocking the direct beam, right? This is always blocking the direct beam and only allowing the diffuse to hit the sensor. So this gives you a measure of diffuse radiation. So what's great is if you have one of these deployed like this and then maybe next to it you have one that's not shaded, that gives you total. This gives you diffuse. You subtract the two to get the direct beam. And uh, so that's that's quite common. Of course, this is a very expensive instrument. so you don't see these very often except at very highly specialized uh, installations. So what we normally do is model the direct and the diffuse beam, right? So we we only have that pyranometer on our weather station so then we um, model the direct and diffuse component and a real popular model for that is um, the what a, a model by the, uh, they call the spitters model and I'll show you how to use that how you can take data from coagmet hourly data from coagmet and estimate the diffuse and direct beam components another important once we know the difference between a direct beam we can um, calculate um, uh, the impact of Lambert's cosine law on the amount of radi radiation incident upon a surface right so you know, we're all sort of familiar with that. If, if we um, face our body right toward the sun, right, so that our, our body is normal to the sun's beams, then we feel a lot more energy than if we're at an angle, right? And so we, we know that the angle at which the solar beams strike the surface affects how much radiation, uh, the radiation density or the, other, or the amount of radiation incident upon the surface. surface. And this is called Lambert's cosine law. There's a good discussion of it in, in the textbook. And basically it says um, the um, flux density at the surface on a horizontal surface is equal to the radiation normal to the sun's beams times the cosine of the zenith angle. Okay. So this would be like the radiation measured by the pyranometer on the weather station. And if you knew the zenith angle, you could predict how much radiation you would get if you took your pyranometer and aimed it straight at the sun, if that makes any sense. Um, so Lambert's cosine law, the key thing to remember, when you want to start predicting the amount of radiation on a slope, 
okay, of gra sloping ground or on ridge till soil or on a leaf that's at an angle, then it becomes really important. Um, you know, let's say you only have data from a weather station, right? So you've just got horizontal surface data from a pyranometer, but you want to estimate the radiation on a north facing slope that has a three degree angle and a south facing slope that has a three degree angle. What's the difference in the amount of radiation incident on those two surfaces, right? So with Lambert's cosine law, you could calculate that. So Lambert's cosine law only applies to um, direct beam radiation, not diffuse, okay? So if you want to use Lambert's cosine law, you got to separate your radiation into its diffuse and direct beam components first, right? So let's take an example. Let's say we have a pyranometer at a weather station that's given us a thousand watts per meter squared. And let's assume that 15% of the total radiation is diffuse. If the zenith angle is 30 degrees, what would the total radiation on a sunflower leaf be that was pointed directly at the sun? That is, its surface is normal to the sun's rays, right? Let's say, you know, we've kind of all seen that, um, you know, like a sunflower leaf. Let's just pretend it's just angled directly at the sun, okay? Like a perfect solar panel, all right? So if our total global radiation was 1,000, and 15% is diffuse, means 150 watts per meter squared is diffuse, and 850 must be direct beam. Okay, so that's the part we need to work with. This is the part that's going to be affected by Lambert's cosine law. So if we go back, plug into this equation here, 10.3, we see that we take 850, that was, that was what was on the normal, right? So if we, yeah, let me go back again. So here's what's coming from our pyranometer. Here's the ang zenith angle, and here's what the radiation would be of that leaf that was pointing straight at the sun. So we're after this term right here. And so we take the 850 divided by the cosine of 30. You do these equations, and um, sometimes it's important to work these in terms of radians. And we see that the total direct beam on that leaf would be 981 watts per meter squared. Okay, that would be the direct beam component. So it's getting a lot of direct beam. Remember there was only 850 on a horizontal surface, but 981 on that leaf that's pointed straight at the sun. Then we have to add the diffuse back in. Remember the diffuse is 150, so we have to add 150 back to this 981 and we get 1131. So basically what you can see is if the surface was on the horizontal surface, we were getting 1,000, right? But on a surface pointed directly at the sun, we were getting 1,131, right? So, well, you know, 13% more energy. Okay, so that's a, a really key thing to grasp and becomes super important when you start trying, when you start including topography in land surface modeling and ET modeling and that kind of thing. And it all Lambert's cosine law is crucial when you start modeling how radiation penetrates through plant canopies, right? And how much is absorbed in different layers and that kind of thing. So um, I think this is a good stopping point. We've gone for almost um, almost 30 minutes here. I think that's plenty long for, for a video. So I'll stop there with Lambert's cosine law. Uh, and uh, make sure you go back maybe and look at some of these links that I gave you. I would highly recommend um, this link right here to Campbell Scientific who has a very nice article on pyranometers, how they work, why they're important. This one right here is particularly good and well written. That would be a really good thing to read to follow up on.